and I would like to go ahead now and introduce Glynis Lloyd and Camille Trzbiatowski. Um, Glynis recently joined us from South Africa, where she had extensive experience um, as an English educator, English language education um, as a teacher, a teacher trainer, and a researcher in the field. And Camille has been with the foundation since 2018, and he too holds extensive experience as an EAL coordinator, um, again, a teacher trainer. Um, he has um, done writing for um, periodicals in the field and also for um, events as well. So without further ado, I will turn it over to both Camille and Glynis. Thank you, Sheila. And um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So our learning intentions today in this session we hope you will extend your understanding of the role of the EAL coordinator and in particular focus on the induction of new arrivals and the initial and ongoing assessment of multilingual learners so that you can use the context of your school to build appropriate policies and practices that meet the needs of multilingual learners. So what I'm going to do now is to do a short recap of the key EAL principles that we introduced you to in our previous webinar, just to remind ourselves of that foundation, but also to create that framework uh, for those of you who perhaps weren't able to join us in part one. So our guiding principles, as we said last time, are equality and inclusion, and they form the foundation of the work that we do. And these principles should be reflected in your policies and your practice and made explicit. The work of a team of researchers from <coughs> Cambridge University led by uh, Professor Evans has shown that these principles need to be reflected in four key areas. Firstly, that teachers' attitudes across the school should reflect an inclusive pedagogy. Secondly, that academic inclusion should prevail in all of the work that you do. Thirdly, that there should be linguistic inclusion. In other words, all of the languages that children bring to their learning should be part of your language programs. And fourthly, that children learning using EAL as a, as a um, using EAL should be included in all the social, sporting, etc. activities of the school. Next, we talked about basing your work on an asset-based approach. And this really has two key aspects. First of all, it involves viewing multilingual learners as an asset to your school for the way in which they contribute towards building a vibrant and diverse school community. And we know from so many teachers and head teachers who talk about the incredibly positive impacts, for example, uh, on the aspirations, on raising aspirations across the whole school community. Secondly, using an asset-based approach involves how you go about devising support and learning programs in which you view the language resources, the multiple resources that multilingual children have as an asset for their learning so that that can form foundations for their learning of and in English. The third key aspect we spoke about was creating a school environment that celebrates multilingualism. Firstly here, we know that for all of us, language and the languages we speak form a key part of who we are, of our identity. So when the languages that we know and use are recognized for part of the school community that we in, it means that we are recognized. Um, so finding out secondly about the languages your children know, your pupils know, what they do in those languages, all their rich language resources, all of that can, can be brought into the programs that you devise for them and how you build an inclusive environment across your school. Lastly, the last key point we want to make is that through your work, through your policies as well, that you create a clear separation 
between EAL and special education needs. This is official government policy. We've taken this extract from the UK government code of, uh, code of practice which states that difficulties related solely to limitations in English as an additional language are not a special educational need. So yes, like in any other population, there may be a few of your learners who are learning um, English as an additional language who may, for example, be dyslexic. What that will require though is separate assessments and separate programs to address those, those needs. So I would like now to hand back to Camille, to hand over to Camille, who's going to address the next, take you through the next section. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Glenis. So yes, uh, we're going to first start with um, uh, reminding ourselves uh, briefly of uh, uh, the EL coordinator's responsibilities, which uh, was something that we talked more extensively uh, uh, in part one of this, this webinar series. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll move on to an induction model. Uh, so, okay. So uh, this is uh, this is a slide that you would have seen uh, um, in the previous webinar. Uh, and so we, we talked about those different responsibilities of EAL coordinators there. Uh, so um, uh, just as, a, uh, as you can see, uh, these are uh, identifying and uh, keeping records of your learners, monitoring their progress, tracking their attainment, uh, assessment of the language development needs, supporting other staff, working with SLT, uh, helping to ensure that curriculum resources uh, reflect school diversity, um, supporting parents so that they can support their children's learning. And then last but not least, uh, planning, teaching and monitoring support. So uh, now uh, I just used the phrase last but not least, and that was on purpose uh, because we'd like to stress that these different responsibilities are not listed here in the order of priority. That is to say, uh, your context of your school, the context of, of the children you, you work with uh, will determine your, your actual priorities. So the context is something that we'll be referring to uh, quite a lot uh, in, in, in this webinar. Uh, and it's, it's quite important to keep this in mind. And uh, also we would like to advise that it is important to delegate some tasks to other staff. So first of all, you would uh, uh, save yourself some workload. And secondly, uh, this ensures that uh, knowledge and awareness of EL pedagogy and approaches to supporting those learners uh, is more spread across the school. Um, and so actually in so doing, the, le the learners will be better supported in different classrooms by teaching assistants, pastoral team, uh, SLT, uh, reception staff, canteen staff, whoever, whoever works in the school. So supporting other staff in the first place can mean your ability to delegate tasks uh, to them, but in the longer, longer run, they will be supporting the children and yourself in your work. So, so that's, that's the general idea of that. Uh, okay, so uh, one more thing that we want to mention here before, before we move on is that these responsibilities that I just talked about, uh, they can be applied as considerations to particular EAL work. So for example, uh, we're going to take up, uh, setting up a multilingual ethos across the school. So you want to do that. So if that's one of your priorities, so what would you need to consider? Well, so we would want to keep accurate records of learners using EAL in terms of the languages that they use. Uh, and so it's so, so that so, so that uh, teachers actually know what languages uh, uh, those learners speak so they can utilize those. Things. So these ideally would be kept on a system such as SIMS uh, or other that is uh, used by your school. Secondly, uh, assessing language development uh, needs is not limited to the English language, but any language. So although of course assessing various home languages can be difficult where no staff speaks those languages, there are some ways in which this can be done. Uh, on our website, we've got a home language assessment page where we offer advice on this area. By the way, any, any links or resources that we mentioned in this webinar will be shared with you uh, tomorrow when the recording of this webinar is going to uh, uh, go out to you. So uh, no need to write everything down uh, because it will be shared with you. Um, and thirdly, progress and attainments uh, do not need to be seen only for the prism of the English language. So for example, mathematical skills of a learner 
uh, can be seen as mediated by their English language proficiency. So it is worth considering training or maybe advising teaching staff on how to distinguish between academic skills and English language proficiency. Uh, there is, of course, no substitute for supporting senior leaders if you want to establish a multilingual ethos across the school. So if senior leaders are involved, of course, it's going to be uh, good to ask question how to best work, work with them to get the best results. If they are, however, unconvinced about the benefits of multilingualism in the school, then you might consider uh, how to get uh, start in getting them on board. So do they perhaps they respond to research? Uh, studies of effective practice, or maybe they can just simply be convinced by other teachers who already uh, use multilingualism approaches in their uh, classrooms. And then um, other teachers might wish to support those uh, those learners by taking advantage of those languages, but maybe they don't know how to go about it. So maybe a training session or a guide booklet on the topic uh, be offered uh, to them, for instance. So you could consider that. Um, multilingualism is, of course, a part of the broader diversity approach to schooling. So if there is a, a member of staff uh, tasked with um, uh, ensuring broader diversity, then maybe you could work with them, or perhaps there could be a group of teachers, for example, teachers of different years meeting termly or at regular intervals uh, to discuss these matters. Uh, and then can parents be invited to school? Uh, for a meeting about how to use uh, their own language to support their children's learning at school. Uh, and maybe uh, there's some other way that multilingual skills can be harnessed. And finally, uh, planning, teaching, and monitoring support. So when teachers in the school plan, uh, do they consider strategies such as translanguaging, which is intentional use of first uh, language for pedagogical means? Uh, so do they, do they do that in their lesson planning? Uh, so maybe the first language could be part of a lesson planning process for teachers across the school. Of course, here you might actually also want to work with the SLT uh, if that's uh, supposed to be the case, because it probably uh, needs to have the backing of senior leaders. Uh, so this, in no, all of this, in no means implies that you should be doing all of this or even most of this. It, all we're suggesting here that these are the areas you could consider in your work. Um, but which you choose uh, to do uh, uh, to work with uh, and to work on uh, is entirely up to you. Okay, so now we are going to look at uh, induction, and so we're going to introduce you to a model of induction that you might choose to use to structure your work uh, in this area. So uh, this model, which we call PAWS, P-A-W-S takes its name from the four stages, uh, which in our view, ill induction should comprise. So these are, uh, P is for prepare. So this is the time before the admission of a learner to school. So by admission, we mean the time before and including the day when the parents come with their child to the school for initial meetings. But this is still before the learner's first day of lessons in school. Then there is A alert, so that comes next. And this is the time between the admission meetings uh, I just spoke about and before the learner's first day. So there will be tasks to be done here before the learner's first day, for example, passing on relevant information to the staff. Uh, uh, and we'll speak about this more momentarily. It will be important that uh, this alert stage, uh, there's, there's a few days between the, the prepare and the next stage. Uh, uh, and that next stage is welcome. Uh, and this is the learner's first days in the school. Uh, and it's important that they are supported as well as possible by all and any members that they encounter. And uh, finally, S is support. And after the initial uh, first days, uh, what do we do in the first uh, few weeks to set up the learner for success and ensure they are supported across the entire curriculum? So this uh, will involve uh, ongoing English and not only English, but language assessment of the learner and assessment uh, 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 and so we'll, we'll speak about the assessments and uh, in more detail shortly. Okay, so I'm going to start looking at P, prepare first. So here, well, well we can arrange the, a tour of the school for pupils and parents. Now, if the learner is new to English, it's likely that so will their parents and carers. So it might be important to have first language uh, support. So L1 starts for first language, uh, but 
even where the incoming adults are more English language proficient, uh, they will appreciate their language being not only acknowledged, but uh, valued in this manner. Um, while the parents and learners make their first visit to the school, it's typical practice to gather information uh, uh, from them about uh, the previous educational history of the child, uh, any specific needs, such as hobbies, interests, strong subjects, uh, special educational needs uh, as well. So now this can be difficult with the language barrier present. So you might consider an interpreter for such a meeting. Uh, but of course, that interpreter might be uh, expensive or just simply unavailable. So uh, there is another, uh, uh, there is a tool if you don't have an interpreter, and that is uh, the South Grid Ease of Learnings tool, online, online background collation tool. And uh, it's free. Uh, it's translated into 17 different languages. That now includes Ukrainian. Uh, and some languages have uh, questions recorded in audio form for parents who might not be able to write in their language. Essentially, they are admission, uh, admission kind of questions translated in all of those languages and it's completely free to use. So uh, I, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant tool uh, to have at our disposal. Um, now, the information that you get from parents can be used to write up the, uh, the learner's ear profile. So, um, now, it's important that we, we are not suggesting here that EL profile, profile should be written for all learners because uh, 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 that would generate enormous amounts of workload. Uh, so perhaps uh, limit yourself to learners, for example, on bands A and B only, uh, particularly in terms of uh, updating those profiles later uh, down the line. Uh, now, on our website, you can find downloadable and free EL profile template, and that's what's on the screen at the moment. Uh, and as you can see, not everything can be completed after the meeting. So, for example, um, assessments of proficiency in English we recommend to be carried not uh, until at least two weeks have passed uh, after the first day in lessons for the learner. But lots of information, of course, can be gathered from the first meeting. Um, additionally, around this time, it's important to provide information to parents about essential things that they need to know. So, for example, organization of the week, how the school communicates with parents, uh, what are the so homework policies in the school. And again, where possible, see if this can be translated for, uh, for parents whose English language skills are less proficient. Uh, at the very least, uh, 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 you could try to provide this information in less formal and more plain English writing style. So, for example, uh, the verb give is likely going to be easier to understand than provide. Uh, so basically, uh, simplify the language a little bit so it's so it's clear and it's easier to understand it. Now we have a parental involvement page, and on this page, uh, you will find our guidance for parents on how to help their child learn within the English educational system is translated into uh, 22 languages, and it is free to download. Uh, and finally, um, agree a start date and organize an initial timetable. If the learner is going into an EL induction, you will need to determine how many lessons, hours they will need to spend there uh, versus mainstream subject lessons. Uh, uh, any withdrawal should be time limited rather than outcome based and any language support should be linked to mainstream curriculum. And this is because of uh, we spoke about this uh, in the first webinar. Uh, because uh, those learners need to simultaneously learn English and through English. So uh, uh, therefore the pedagogy has to be different and it should not be longer than 12 weeks uh, in our view. Okay. Uh, and in this circle, these are the same icons you would have seen before. This suggests uh, 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 how it links to those responsibilities. Uh, so for example, this is SLT, uh, at the bottom there, there's the parents and that's collecting data. So if you see this, this is just for you to consider. Uh, who would you need to work with uh, if you wanted uh, to, uh, particularly if you wanted to relieve yourself a little bit of that workload and work with other people in the school? Okay, now we are on alert stage. So first of all, um, once the EL pro profile has been produced, it's time to share this with the relevant staff and uh, relevant staff uh, being the operative phrase, that is to say, uh, not all staff will deal with the child, so uh, sending emails to uh, teachers who do not need this information, uh, it would be overloading them, so uh, do not send them unnecessarily. Uh, secondly, organize a buddy system, so who will support uh, the new child from day one, 
meeting them in reception, taking them to class, uh, then to lunch and offer peer-to-peer -peer support on the first day. Ideally, the bodies would speak different, the same language as the learner, but it's not always possible, of course. Uh, but these learners need to know what's expected of them and what's actually not expected uh, of them in this role. And that uh, takes us to Young Interpreter Scheme. Uh, uh, this is a suite of uh, training resources, which you can use to train people who would be buddies or student translators. This role includes buddies, but it's not limited to it. Such learners can act as translators at events such as parents' evenings, for example, and certain meetings where there's no confidential information being shared. Um, the training program demonstrates to learners how to behave and how not to when interacting with others in the role of translators. Uh, so very, very useful program to know about. Uh, and then you will need to uh, make certain arrangements in all likelihood before the learner starts. Uh, so for example, uh, does the learner have the full uniform and the PE kit? Are they eligible for free school meals? Uh, uh, will they need a prayer room if they're religious and observant? Again, you could choose here, here to work with pastoral team rather than uh, 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 make all of these inquiries yourself. So there's space here for working with other people. And finally, uh, before the learner's first day arrives, you will need to plan support for each part of the day. So uh, if you, you can think about it uh, uh, about a day bit by bit. When the learner arrives in the reception, who takes them to the classroom, what happens in their lessons, what happens during break times at the end of the day, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, okay. And now we are, and again, I'm showing these icons to suggest who you might work where, uh, with, but uh, that also needs to be contextualized to your particular workplaces. We're going to move to welcome, which is uh, uh, where, so uh, when the new arrival comes to the school in the morning, there's someone to greet them. Uh, it's useful to work with reception staff as well, because receptions can be very busy first thing in the morning and have a plan what to say to a learner or potentially parent. Um, secondly, uh, introduce new learners to their buddies whom we've just spoken about. Uh, they could come to the reception, of course, uh, or perhaps uh, they would be in the classroom, depending on how it works. Uh, check that the learner has food and drink, and not just at lunchtime, but at other breaks. Might be a good idea to uh, allow learners, uh, who are new to English, to have a quiet classroom uh, to go to during breaks, uh, because uh, being exposed to a new language all day will be exhausting. Uh, and uh, such a breathing space will, be, will bring great relief to many, many learners. And, uh, and finally, check if they understand uh, what they are doing and who to ask for help. So uh, many schools use communication funds for learners. Uh, these are laminated cards with pictures and words on them in cases such as, can I go to the toilet? My tummy hurts, you have a picture there, maybe a short phrase, but all it takes is to just put that card up uh, in, uh, for the teacher to see without the need to speak. Uh, uh, which is uh, was going to be very, very helpful in those first days. Um, okay, and now we are on to the last stage, which is support. So after those first days, it will be important to consider what needs to be done to ensure uh, ongoing robust support of the learner. So you will need to plan for language support uh, to be put in place. Now, many new to English learners will be placed in an in intensive language uh, support program. I've already said this shouldn't be longer than 12 weeks. Uh, those induction programs are likely going to in include survival uh, English lessons of some kind, but it's important that all of this is taught in the context of the curriculum. So if you've got sentences such as, it is a boy or it is a girl, this can be easily replaced with, it is a king, it is a queen, and now you are li linking to part uh, uh, potentially particular kind of queen or, uh, or king from English history, and you can link to the history curriculum in that way. Uh, now, some resources that can be helpful are uh, thinking what to include in the uh, withdrawal program. So here are some of the resources. First of all, great ideas and teaching resources. These are our, from our website. So great ideas is a selection of 20 different strategies and teaching resources free to download uh, for specific lessons and, and topics. Uh, Learning Village is an interactive game-like online environment. It's a dedicated app specifically designed for learners who use EAL and are new to English and particularly for primary learners. Uh, so very, very useful. Uh, and uh, 
they are a lot of the lessons in there are academic or subject based lessons. So very, very useful for our purposes. Collaborative learning project has a number of really downloadable resources for groups of learners and it pr promotes meaningful communication. Uh, not just between uh, learners who use EAL, but between learners who use EAL and other learners. So that's quite important. Um, Raising to English is a CD full of printable resources for new to English uh, learners. Uh, Raising to Literacy is an EAL focused program of phonics, and you have lesson plans in there um, as well uh, for teachers, and it's free. And finally, um, uh, CLIL, which stands for Content and Language Integrated Learning, which is an approach used in many European countries where learners uh, in those non-Anglophone countries learn subjects through English. But we can use this the same approach for our purposes uh, for those multilingual learners. Uh, so the link here is to a, a, a resource pack uh, 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 for uh, primary age learners uh, um, uh, where for subjects such as science, maths, and geography. Okay. If you have uh, uh, TAs, uh, consider how to support the learner or learners when they are not in this role, but in mainstream lessons. So then you need to uh, uh, determine how many lessons or hours can the support be offered. Do they need training? Uh, how will the TAs and uh, teachers work together? Uh, 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 also communicate with uh, a pastoral team, they should be aware of any difficulties a learner faces. Uh, for example, when they are asylum seeker or a refugee suffering from trauma and in need of emotional support. Uh, complete initial EAL assessment, but Glynis will be talking about this uh, in the second part of the uh, webinar today, so I leave it for then. And finally, uh, support mainstream teachers so they are able to support uh, um, um, uh, learners who are new to English. In other words, can provide strategies, offer resources, and offer CPD uh, if you can. So you could have open doors, for example, which would be the time in the week where after school teachers uh, and other staff might come to your room and ask uh, for support or, 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 or for advice, so very informal. Uh, other informal training sessions are possible. For example, you could focus on one strategy, for example, one of our great ideas, such as substitution tables, graphic organizers, or perhaps in one scale, such as speaking skills, and how to, uh, how to uh, uh, develop those skills in, in those learners. Uh, you could send a monthly one-page newsletter to all staff uh, with advice and resources, something quick uh, and something short and easily digestible. And finally, offer CPT to the whole school and uh, ideally to do this at some regular intervals. Okay, so just one last thing from, uh, from me at this point. Um, there's a wealth of resources and guidance on the Bell Foundation uh, website uh, to help you to support other teachers and staff. So have a look at our guidance section uh, because we've got numerous articles, documents, many downloadable on a variety of different aspects of uh, EAL provision. And also in addition, you might consider EAL Mesh Guide, uh, which offers quick summaries uh, of EAL research in different areas, such as, as you can see, assessment, reading skills, speaking skills, multilingualism, uh, IT, and, and others. And it's written in plain English, easy to share, and to written by top experts in the UK. Uh, so, okay. So, um, now it does, uh, so now it gives me great pleasure to welcome Tracy Wilson. She's going to share with us her experience of leading on EAL in her school. Uh, Tracy works as EAL coordinator at Goldington Green Academy and was appoint, appointed uh, as SLE, Specialist Leader in Education for EAL across Peter Pan Teaching Alliance in 2016. Tracy is currently working with Bedford's Borough School Improvement Team, supporting schools to develop their practice and help raise standards for EAL learners across the borough. Uh, Tracy uh, only became Bell Foundation's licensed practitioner last year and already is playing a significant role, including running training, networking meetings for Bedford Borough Schools. Today, Tracy is going to share with us her experience and knowledge of preparing and running induction process. So, uh, uh, that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Tracy. Welcome. Uh, I think you, you need to unmute yourself.
Lovely. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much, Camille and Vinis, for inviting me along to share um, some of our induction processes, practices um, with the rest of um, the practitioners attending today. OK, so a lovely introduction. Thank you, Camille. I'm very impressed um, by what you found out about me and very pleased and uh, feel very welcome and honoured that I'm with you guys today. OK, so today we're focusing on EAR, induction processes. So I'm going to share some of our practice at Gaunton Green Academy. Academy. Am I sharing? You are sharing. Yeah, it's, it's not showing. It's just you need to, yeah. It's not moving. Let me escape, maybe. Let me stop sharing. Sorry. And let's try again. Right. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So we have to share this. OK. Um, yeah. Right. So our school context. So really just put it into into um, context of what our school is. So we are a large primary school, 630 children on roll. And we are an academy. Recently, we became an, an academy. Um, we're located in Bedford, which is East Anglia. We're 32 percent EAL. Um, so we're above national average. I think national average was around about 19.5% in 2022. Um, we have 34 different languages spoken here at home. Okay, so induction. Who's involved? Well, it's everybody. This is a whole school approach, and I appreciate that um, everyone will have different starting points. Um, so for, I've been doing this for a very long time. So for me, it was all about everyone take um, being involved and taking some sort of responsibility. So everyone, every member of staff here is involved in our induction process. Um, that includes the admin staff, teachers, TAs, children, buddies, midday supervisors, head teacher, myself, and parents. Policies. So in order to embed this practice, we had to look at our policies and how we were going to um, you know, cascade that information down so everyone felt involved and took ownership for the different areas. So we have the main EAL policies, and that policy is linked to many other policies such as language, equality, inclusion, multicultural, and our values-based policy as well. We also have an EAL induction policy. Now that really basically looks at everyone's roles and responsibility, in particular the class teacher, because she has a big role to play in this. If you're going to manage um, a large percentage of EAL learners and be effective um, with that practice, you're going to have to delegate some of the responsibilities. You, you won't be able to manage it all. In my opinion, it's very difficult. So we have some of these documents that support, first of all, which we've got the, um, the class teachers roles and response. So what she needs to do in order to, um, to welcome that child and make sure she's communi communicating effectively with parents. We also have the background information form where Camille spoke about that, the Be um, Bell Foundation, they also have a profiling form. This is our profiling form. We have um, a parent's booklet. So we explain to the parent, how do we meet the needs of their children? And we also have a whole buddy scheme, um, very similar to the young interpreters. I did use it as an initial um, start to, to developing this within our school. Um, and it's all about the buddies. So the buddies, what their responsibilities are and what their the expectations are. So that's shared with them as well. Okay, so going back to the pause model. Um, so we're looking at first prepare, alert, welcome and support. So here are some of our processes that we used in order to link in with this model. Okay, so Preparing prior to admissions, Camille spoke about these are the things that you need to do beforehand. So the class teacher, in our, in our case, it's the class teacher, she makes contact with the parents and arranges a home visit. Now, it doesn't matter if they've joined us midterm, in year six, et cetera, we still provide that home visit. And then we set a date for the school tour. Within that meeting, we look at sharing the expectations that we have. So whether it's like Camille said, looking at um, uniform, the expectations around uniform, um, healthy um, lunches, um, you know, supporting the children with their reading, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, gathering background information, very vital in terms of learning who this pupil is. Um, quite often children have had some exposure to English language teaching. Some countries, the language of instruction is English. So we've got to ascertain all of that before um, the child actually joins the school. So we agree a, a um, start date. Again, we al allow at least a minimum of three days so we can prepare for this child when they arrive. So nobody thinks, oh my goodness, who's this child? Where do they come from? What do they know? I don't know anything. And it sort of cuts out a lot of time guessing and you know uncertainty about the child. So we've agreed as a whole school that we will allow a minimum of three days before we accept the child into school. Um, and then obviously when the child arrives, we um, with the family, we do the school tour and we prepare a dual language welcome booklet, which I believe comes from Mantra Lingra. Okay, alert, before that pupil starts, we inform the class teacher of the new arrival. And in fact, that it's the admin staff that tell the class teacher that actually that you are going to have this new child in class and their profile form is in one of the children's um, folders, which is their yellow files, where all their information is kept. So that's down to that class teacher then to go and read that. I don't photocopy and give it to them. They go and read that. Class teacher follows her roles and responsibility checklist. She informs the class and assigns buddies. Now we always assign more than one buddy in case of personality clash, and um, we think it's better. Um, so yeah, and the, again, the buddies at this stage know what the expectations are. Um, the teacher again will sort of make a very sort of welcoming learning environment, whether it's using um, the pupil's home language to do a simple displays like counting or welcome, or it could be through our dual language books. It could be a, just a display of dual language books or directing the child in this area, we have books in your home language. And we have also talking pens in about so many different languages. So, and obviously every class teacher will prepare their pegs, drawers, and to create a sense of belonging. So the first few days we meet and greet the pupil on day one, the parents provide dual language welcome booklet and GGA meeting the needs of um, pupils with English as additional language that's given to the parent. Introduction to buddies. We monitor the pupils engagement as instruction and structure times. So quite often I would um, invite them into our lunchtime club, which is our socially speaking club. So that's through board games, et cetera. And they get to sort of begin to learn to, to mingle with the wider school community. We do a baseline assessment, assessment um, and we set targets, but that's really after about two and a half weeks. We allow them to settle, to allow them to show us what they know, and obviously scaffolding, um, translated um, learning intentions, et cetera, and frames that can support the child with to be able to demonstrate what they know. And then we do a baseline assessment. Support in the first few weeks, we continue to provide support for as long as it takes to, so that we know that the child is secure with routines, learning structures, um, expectations, behavior, that sort of thing. So that, that support continues within the classroom, in particular at lunchtime, until we feel that that child is ready. We assign EAR support. So for us, we have the Learning Village Program is our main tool for supporting English language development a fantastic online program, I couldn't recommend it more. Um, so we have our own learning village. And um, yeah, so, so that's one of the main tools. Within that program, you're looking at developing social English as well as the academic proficiency as well. And accessing the um, curriculum. So a very, very good program, couldn't recommend it more. Okay, continue to keep regular contact with parents, always keeping in contact with parents that they're making sure that they're you know, they're aware of um, that the child's PE is on Tuesday, that they're to come in uniform on that day. Um, any concerns that we may have in the first week, we'll always make contact to say, actually, so-and-so, Joe Bloggs is settling really down really well, and we're hoping that um, he's enjoying his time. We have noticed, however, that sort of thing. So it's that regular contact with the parents. Um, monitoring the pupil progress and these through formative assessments, that's ongoing assessment in the classroom, observations, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're using that as a tool to only, not only to set the targets, but actually to monitor their attainment progress as well. Okay, so that is it for me. I had Thank 10 you. minutes and I hope I haven't been long. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, so much. Thank you very much. Uh, huge amounts of ideas there. Uh, and. Uh, um, 
Yeah, so so uh, thank you very much. That's that's quite useful to see how uh, things that we talk about, which is the, the same model being actually instantiated in, in the school. So thank you very much for uh, for taking the time to uh, to, to uh, contribute. I'm going to uh, uh, share my screen again, and uh, Glynis is going to take over. Uh, to Thank talk about you. assessment and target setting. Yeah. Thank you, Camille. Yes, and it really kind of follows on very nicely now from what Tracy's been talking about, that uh, uh, those initial assessments and setting targets. Um, and so we're going to look at how the EAL coordinator can plan and lead in this area while drawing in staff across the school to carry out the work. So when we think about assessment, um, we we really consider it in three in three areas um and this is not as we've said before this is not all the work of the eao co coordinator that's not really feasible so this is another important area where getting the backing of your senior leadership team so that you can roll out those responsibilities across your staff so that everybody who's involved teaching or supporting a particular child is, is involved in this process. Um, and of course, key here is training, training of staff who will be supporting um, these children. And this is important really because then your school needs, a, there needs to be a plan for regular assessment and an agreement across the staff as to which children will be prioritized. So how can you encourage then Moving on to, to how you can get your senior leadership team to invest in training and assessment for all your staff. So it could be it could be useful to draw on really powerful research from Professor Strand and Dr. Hessel at Oxford University, whose work has shown the very strong link between proficiency in English and educational achievement and how essential and central proficiency in English is. Um, and this has also shown, the work has also shown uh, how crucial support for these children is across, uh, across the board. So these slides indicate how their work has shown that children who we assess fall into the first two bands, either because they're completely new to English or they're in those early stages of acquisition, that they will be achieving uh, significantly below the national average academically. And again, this highlights the importance of assessing proficiency in English and how it can help you then set targets and, and plan, plan learning support, putting that in place. And next, we can see that even for the, for the next band, where children are moving on to developing competence, that they will still be falling below the national average in attainment. And last, it's only once we get to the groups who are now competent or even fluent in English, that they will then be achieving uh, well above the national average academically. So how do you go about assessing then? So the Bell Foundation has an award-winning EAL assessment framework for schools. Um, it is curriculum embedded. It assesses how English is used by learners in the mainstream classroom, and it promotes formative assessment which then helps you plan and support learning. And it's available on our website to be downloaded for free. Just quickly how that looks. Uh, the framework is divided up into the four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and viewing, and writing for each band that, that we listed in the previous slides. For each band, um, for each of those domains, there are then 10 descriptors. So that's what's running down uh, each band. Um, and these, you can use these descriptors to help you identify and set learning targets. And you'll see at the beginning, uh, at the top of each band are the descriptors that are generally associated with early development as, as learners move down, and they don't necessarily do this in, in this chronological order. But as they move down to later descriptors, it then gives you a sense that they're moving closer to the next band. 
And just to quickly make the point that it's very um, expected, we would expect that children could have what we call spiky pro profiles. So for example, they might, the descriptors might indicate that on bad, they've they're on band B for listening, um, but they're not quite ready to or confident enough to be talking yet, so they might then fall on band A uh, for speaking, for example. The focus in, in the descriptors is on language functions. So it's very much looking at, not at grammar specifically, but at the kinds of language or the way of using language that children need for their learning across the curriculum. So for example, if we look at the, the uh, descriptor from band C, where it says that they, uh, at band C, they should be able to make relevant spontaneous comments socially and during tasks, for example, making comparisons and contrasts. Now we know that language is valuable in maths, children having to talk about bigger, smaller, and so on. It's valuable in science, um, hotter, you know, if they're describing something that's happened in, 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 a, uh, in, a, in an experiment. Um, so again, these descriptors are very useful for, for teachers across the curriculum in setting up and planning uh, their support structures. And so when we talk about assessing for levels of support, just how would that work across the band? So for example, if a learner's in band A at the bottom there, we know that they will need a considerable amount of support both in the classroom and socially, uh, which is why the buddy systems, for example, are just so important. For band B, children will in that band will still need a significant am amount of EAL support uh, in all their classes to access to assess the to access the curriculum. Sorry. Um, but they should at that stage be using a little bit more English in social settings. In band C, they should be getting gaining more confidence in social settings, but are still going to need ongoing support to access the curriculum fully. In band D, they'll need some support, especially to access complex material. And then in band E, they're operating largely without support, although keep an eye out for sort of complex cultural references and things like that that might be um, uh, inaccessible. Linked to our framework then, also on the website are very detailed, um, these are also downloadable support strategies that set out multiple strategies that you can use in each of the four domains. Um, and teachers can then use these once they've done a proficiency in English assessment, these can be used to then inform the support strategies that they're going to, to use in the classroom. Um, and just to say that at this point that we run courses on assessment, if you go to the website, um, for example, you'll see we have a course on assessment starting at the end of February. If you visit our website, you'll be able to access additional ideas on our, on our great ideas page that give you all of these examples um, around how to, to use these strategies and more. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our colleague, Karen Warwick. Karen is a trainer at the Bell Foundation. She's worked for decades as a primary school teacher and as an EAL specialist in local authorities, where she's guided and supported teachers who are teaching learners using EAL. And today she's going to share some of her experience on assessment and the benefits that accrue from that, that she has seen in the schools where she has worked. Welcome, Karen, and over to you. Uh, thanks, Glynis. Um, okay, so I'm just going to talk about kind of in two halves, really. It's kind of from a time before um, and more around the present day. So describing practices of assessment and target setting um, in, in, in my work um, over the years. So flipping right back to the late 90s, um, my experience um, a school's experience of EAL assessment and target setting and data collection for EAL learners was historically the overall responsibility of an external local EA, a local authority EAL service of which I was part of. Um, as a specialist, one of our main roles was, of course, to assess the proficiency of English learners, um, including new arrivals, um, which loosely followed some of the pause model that's already been described. Um, so 
because of time, I'm just going to whiz through it. Um, so firstly, as Tracy's uh, talked about and has been uh, described um, earlier, um, we had an initial meeting would take place with the families to collect all that vital um, information, ideally before the child started the school in school, but that didn't always happen back then. Um, but what did happen was information was recorded and it was shared with the appropriate class teacher so that they had the knowledge, that knowledge of, of the child. Um, of course, initial assessments, which were also carried out again a couple of weeks or so after a child started school. And for reasons that have already been said, this gave them time to settle, to build their confidence, and also to ensure that this initial assessment allowed the learner to, to really authentically demonstrate what their proficiency in English really is, because learners coming into schools don't always come as a beginner in a band A, they may be a band B, they may be a band C. It really depends on all that vital information that you've collected and what you know about, about your child. But what teachers were encouraged to do um, was to observe learners in their class because us as specialist teachers were only in that school for a very short period of time through a scheduled kind of timetable, really. We were not there every day, all day, all week. Um, so, you know, we were they were encouraged to to take notes and to watch how children were playing, how they were socializing, approaching their learning in those first weeks, following routines, what they were understanding. And of course, the initial assessment was also differentiated sort of between key stage one and key stage two, whereas key stage one would be very interactive. Um, I personally love to use what was in the classroom, what was available, um, what I could find to, to play with the children, whether it was good uh, good quality reading books in their in their in the uh, role play areas, anything that could give me an idea of what their proficiency in English was at that moment, apart from what everyday vocabulary they were picking up, instructions, numbers, colours, all that kind of basic stuff. And the key stage format would be more age appropriate, but following a, a, a similar process. So, and again, the initial assessment, as I've kind of alluded to, um, was a real opportunity um, to activate their prior knowledge, the prior knowledge of these learners, and to elicit some level of home language proficiency that they may be willing to share with you, uh, particularly older learners um, as well, if they've had um, an education and learned to read and write, et cetera, in, in, in schools that they've come to. So again, that prior knowledge um, and information gathering is so vital to knowing all of this. Outcomes, well, of course, they would be recorded, discussed with class teachers, so they had a starting point now to, to work with the children and be a pro, use appropriate target setting and strategies um, within the classroom context and kind of lessen that intervention approach as well. Um, so that was very much the, the remit of, of the service and certainly the, the work when you were in the class with the teachers, it was about working with them in the class to support the learner, not taking them out to work with them. We did ongoing formative assessments, which took place each term for all EAL learners. Um, you definitely always in the October time um, to sort of kind of iron out any sort of language loss that happened over the summer break and what had been, you know, gathered up again um, by them being back at school. That would be recorded. We would do something in the Easter term and always at the end of the summer term um, to inform the end of year outcomes. Um, again, you know, this was done through a lot of it was done through writing samples, either independently or by using their books. And because we were working with teachers in the classroom, you could you could you know, you could see what writing you could use to um, to inform you know, what needed, what progress had been made and highlight what needed to be addressed. And the idea was to correlate this with standardised tests and data collection and that was already in place to see where the learner's proficiency in English was sitting um, um, against the standardised outcomes and, and age outcomes. 
So one thing we had was, which was uh, lovingly known as a PAR, a Pupil Achievement Record Tracking Booklet, um, which recorded everything, followed a child right through their start of school through to secondary. Uh, it carried all the information that was required so that none of that was doubled up. Um, and above all, it showed how their proficiency in English had been tracked and assessed through their time at school and how long it was taken, where there were plateaus um, and where, where they gained progress quickly. And as part of the LA, um, um, as part of the LA, we also, uh, to build capacity, we also did a lot of training in schools. And one of the trainings we used to do was on understanding the descriptors of what was known then as the five stage model of EAL. So kind of fast forward in a number of years now, a lot has changed and the demise and reduction of many local authority and EAL services provided me with an opportunity to work independently with some schools in my area and local authority who realised that they needed to independently understand and assess the proficiency of English with their, of their learners in the school because they had to record it in the school management systems to inform funding, et cetera. So they needed to do it and they didn't know how to do it. Um, and um, in, as, as, uh, because we had always done it um, and they'd had no input into this assessment process or target setting. So, so I say some schools took a positive step to empower themselves, took a collective approach, take the responsibility on how to do this. This opportunity coincided for them and for me with the launch of the Bell Foundation's EAL assessment framework uh, and the new research as highlighted by Guinness just then. And the authority, the, the, the authority I work, did work in was also interested in promoting this assessment, the EAL assessment tool um, throughout the authority. So all this and penultimately the commitments of the head teachers meant that training and support for EAL assessment framework was delivered internally by me to all the staff. And as a result of the training, um, and where we are now, and the kind of the following um, comments come from an EAL coordinator that I worked with closely in this indep independent uh, um, role. Um, and this is what uh, they've uh, fed back to me, because obviously I'm with the Bell now, not with them. Um, the Bell, if they, the Bell, if the Bell Foundation assessment framework and tracker tool that was adopted. All the staff, as I said, were trained by me, and ongoing training goes on and and self study on it, and and they use the and it's important to note that this you know it was done alongside the local authority recommending it too, so they were following um, a wider picture, and following on from this. Um, while I was in the school with the teachers, individual time was given to the teachers to work with me one-to-one um, -to, -one to support them initially in assessing the writing, what to look for, how to navigate the descriptors and the tracker tool. So it was a very robust process that was um, provided for me for me to do to do this. And again, supported by the head teachers. Um, the ENA, an EAL coordinator was appointed who only facilitates the assessments, ensures they're carried out at the appropriate times that the school has decided to do uh, to do them. Um, planning for EAL is um, carried out and they offer whole, you know, a school wide support um, where it's needed, as well as, you know, collating <laughs> and organizing all that data. I know that they keep an Excel tracker, uh, which they store within their academic year files on their school teams that every member can access and it's regularly checked and updated. And I know that the EAL coordinator contributes when asked and whenever he is asked to weekly planning sessions to offer appropriate resources and strategies uh, to teachers if they, they're unsure what to do with individual children. And what they have found is that using the tracker consistently has given them the confidence that their stages of EAL are more accurate than they are, were, more embedded in what they're teaching rather than um, from sort of intervention. Understanding and having accurate EAL stages has meant that they um, can more effectively understand the needs of the individual learners, their targets are, and their strategies are more robust now to support them in class and 
the, as I said, the final thing is that the head teachers really support it. So they know it's their responsibility um, and they have to, to do it. And it's created that clarity and consistency um, throughout the school uh, in doing that. And of course, it has empowered the staff to take responsibility positively. And I don't know if I've got time. Do you want me to stop now, Glynis? Yeah, thank you, Karen. Thank you okay. so much. Because that's such a positive and inspiring note, it's you know, great, to yes. see the impact okay. There's of, all, <laughs> of all this okay. training. And actually, I want to just carry on now from where, what Karen also mentioned, which is the other two areas, which I'm quickly going to cover, which of assessing curriculum knowledge and first language knowledge. And just to say for assessing curriculum knowledge, just to advise you against using um, uh, assessments that are designed for English uh, language speakers, they're not always effective. Uh, as our next slide will show, uh, they often contain complex grammar and vocab, cultural references that will be foreign, unknown meanings of un of words and task types that, that uh, new arrivals are not necessarily used for. Um, and also secondly, to avoid tasks which require a lot of a lot of talking because in fact then you're assessing proficiency in English rather than um, curriculum knowledge. And instead to advise to use visuals, um, using the learner's home language where you can, using things like matching, sequencing, graphic organizers where the child can show you what they know. And then that third area that Karen mentioned is assessing what children know and can do in the languages that they know. And again, this is being able to draw on the kind of literacy and language resources that children already have as a foundation for other learning. And how you could do that is talking with parents and caregivers, trying to access information from previous schools, reports that they might have, and where necessary using a professional uh, interpreter. So finally, I'm just going to rush through our last section um, on this issue that we keep talking about, which is whole, whole school training, how to do it and why it's so important. And of course, there are multiple benefits of that, taking the load off you as the coordinator, getting everyone invested in, in an inclusive EAL pe pedagogy and reaching all of the staff, support, pastoral and teaching staff who will be engaged with children. So I want to talk about our service, what we offer. We have these, uh, as we've talked about, Tracy is a fantastic example of a, a Bell Foundation licensed practitioner. They are licensed to run our courses in their areas. Those green dots tell you where they are. And by connecting with these practitioners, you'll be able to access training that is specifically, more specifically targeted for the conditions where you are. Um, and we're just opening up new centers in Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Bristol and, and Coventry. Training for you, we've talked a lot about fund, uh, Bell Foundation courses. These are some of those that are coming up. NALDIC is the Association uh, for English Additional Language. They have regional in interest groups you can link up with. And of course, um, looking at groups on social media, uh, joining forums on social media. Um, training for your for your staff. Once you've had training, you can share that with your staff. You can use resources on the foundation, for example, our Great Ideas page, and encourage your teachers to use them and then report back to the last to the rest of staff, to your staff. And then finally, just to announce that uh, we're very pleased to shortly be um, uh, publishing recommendations for sustainable provision in schools for children who are refugees. And we'll also be very shortly calling for partners for people to become Bell Foundation um, practitioners and joining our centers of expertise. So sign up to our, our, our newsletters, our website, so that you can receive notifications um, of all of that, uh, of all of our forthcoming events and uh, resources. And thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, and especially to our to our two guests, Tracy Wilson and Karen Warwick, for for giving us so much uh, depth and detail for, uh, from your work. Thank you for watching the Bell Foundation's webinar recording. If you want to explore these ideas further, you can watch this recommended clip. 
Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel so that you can be the first to watch the Bell Foundation's latest content.